I'm Christelle from Diabetes Strong. In this video, I'll be going over how to lower your A1C. And that includes specific meaningful steps that you can take to keep your A1C in a healthy range. First, I'll spend a little bit of time explaining what is an A1C, what is a quote unquote normal A1C, why we focus so much on that number and how to measure it. If you do not care about any of this, if you just wanna to get to the four things that you can do to improve your A1C, just go down in the video description and click on that time code, or you can fast forward. A1C or hemoglobin A1C or HbA1C or glucohemoglobin test, all the name for the same thing. And that is a blood test that shows you your average blood sugars for the last two to three months. It's worth noting that it's not an even average in the sense that your blood sugars the last few weeks will weigh a little heavier than your blood sugars two to three months ago. If your A1C is high, that means that your blood sugars on average are elevated. And elevated blood sugars increases the risk of diabetes-related complications. People who do not live with diabetes usually have an A1C of 5.7% or lower. And it's worth noting that whenever you hear the term normal A1C, it often refers to an A1C for people who do not live with diabetes. So when we talk optimal A1C levels for people living with diabetes, the American Diabetes Association's 2022 recommendation is that most adults should aim for an A1C of 7% or lower. That equals an average blood sugar of 154 milligrams per deciliter, or that's 8.6 millimole per liter. And you can see a full conversion table here. So while you look at that, I do wanna add that I had a chance to interview Dr. Ann Peters, and she is a professor of medicine at the Keck School of Medicine of USC and director of the USC Clinical Diabetes Programs. And I interviewed her for an article on the Diabetes Strong website. And her perspective is that A1C targets should be adjusted for the individual. For example, someone who's pregnant might wanna keep the A1C at 6% or below, and an older person's target should be higher. Generally, she finds that having an A1C target of 6 to 7% is ideal, and that going below 7% has fairly little impact on complications. So a very low A1C shouldn't necessarily be an end goal in itself, especially if that low A1C is achieved through a lot of low blood sugars. A lot of people now focus on time and range, especially if you wear a continuous glucose monitor. The goal then is to stay as much of the time between 70 milligrams per deciliter and 180 milligrams per deciliter. But we do focus a lot on A1C because it is an indicator of your average blood sugars over time. And multiple studies have showed that elevated average blood sugars can lead to diabetes-related complications. So lowering your A1C to the recommended levels and keeping it there can help you reduce the risk of diabetes-related complications. You might have heard about some of these potential complications. They all sound very scary. They include eye, kidney, and nerve disease, as well as cardiovascular disease. We should definitely aim for blood sugars at a healthy level. It's also worth noting that the closer you get to the recommended A1C target range, the less benefit you'll get from lowering your A1C even further. So for example, lowering your A1C from 12 down to 11% makes a big difference, whereas lowering it from seven down to 6% provides smaller benefit. A1C is measured by testing a sample of your blood and you can either have that done at the doctor's office or you can do it with an at-home A1C test. So I actually sampled a few different tests and I made a video about that. I'll link to that up here so you can check it out. If your doctor recommends that you lower your A1C or if you just decided that you want to, or if you're struggling to keep your A1C steady, there are a few different things you can do. I personally aim for an A1C of 6.5% or lower. I would rather be closer to six to be honest. This was my latest test. Um, so I'm pretty much there. And these are the four things that I consistently do to achieve that. So as I just mentioned, I'll be going over the four things that I do consistently to keep my A1C below 6.5%. I do have to add that you should not make any changes to your diabetes management without consulting your medical team first. Analyzing my numbers and addressing pain points frequently. What I found to be the most impactful thing to do when it comes to my diabetes management is to review my historic blood sugar numbers every few days and not just rely on my endos analysis whenever I see her every three to four months. I look at my historic blood sugar data every few days and assess whether or not I need to make any changes to my diabetes management. 
Unless I meant usually I have a pretty good idea even before I look at the data whether or not anything major has come up because you know I'll remember if I've had repeatedly high blood sugars in the afternoon or have been going high or low overnight. But I also know that memory can be totally unreliable so I'd rather look at hard data. And what I look at is I look at, at my Dexcom report so that's a continuous glucose monitor I wear that sends my blood sugar readings automatically to my phone and I also look at my InPen report. So InPen is a smart insulin pen that I use and combine those two devices, they collect all my blood sugar data as well as all my insulin injection data. But you don't need all that gear to get good data. All you need is a glucometer, frequent blood sugar measurements and a notebook. But of course it's not enough to just look at the numbers. I also look for pain points or set differently. I look, I look for trends that can indicate that I should make changes to my diabetes management. And that leads me to the second thing that I do consistently to keep my A1C below 6.5%. And that is making changes to my diabetes management when needed. And that can be daily. I manage my blood sugars using insulin. So often making changes to my doses on a daily basis makes sense. I manage using a long acting insulin that I take in the morning as well as the evening as well as a rapid acting insulin that I take for meal and corrections. So my long acting insulin that I take in the morning is probably the one I change the dose off the least, I'd say. But I do change it once in a while. So especially if I find that I run, let's say, high in the afternoons consistently. If I find that I run high in the afternoons and let's say it's outside the four hour window after I last took a rapid acting insulin, then I have a fairly good idea that it's my long acting insulin that's off and I'll make changes the next day. And remember, I said consistently. So for example, one afternoon high, that's just an event, that's not a pattern. So if I consistently see that I have highs in the afternoon, for example, then I'll make the change. I adjust my nighttime long acting insulin fairly frequently. So I'll adjust it depending on my activity level and my eating pattern. So I'll vary between anything from one unit to eight units before you know I go to bed in the evening. So that's quite a lot. And then when it comes to my rapid acting insulin, again, the one for meal and corrections, for that one, I have kind of an assumptions that I go by. And the assumption is that I have a carb ratio of one to 10. So that means that one unit of insulin covers 10 grams of carbs. I also assume that I have a correction factor or an insulin sensitivity factor of 50, meaning that one unit of insulin will lower my blood sugars 50 milligrams per deciliter. So that's a base assumption. But let me give you an example. I recently noticed that my blood sugars would start to climb just before bed, which I would correct. So they would climb to maybe 160, 175, and I would correct with one unit of insulin, assuming a correction factor or insulin sensitivity factor of 50. However, what I found was that that was actually too much. I was dropping down in the low glucose territory. I was getting closer to 70 and below, which of course I don't want to be there, especially not at night. So what that made me realize that after that had happened a few times, again, I needed to see that consistently before making a change. Then I could go in, look at my data, actually realize that one unit of insulin at 10 p.m. in the evening was actually lowering my blood sugars closer to 100 milligrams per deciliter. That means that my correction factor at that time was probably, is probably 100 and not 50. That's a small tweak, it's only half a unit. But that small tweak meant that I can correct my blood sugars so I don't go high while maintaining healthy blood sugars and not going low either. Again, small tweak, but it's based off of my data. If you do not manage your diabetes using insulin, you probably won't have to assess your medical needs as often. However, I wouldn't go years without having that discussion with your medical team. And even if you do not manage your diabetes using any medications, there's still things you can do and we'll be talking a little bit about food shortly. And the third thing that I do to keep my A1C below 6.5% is to exercise consistently. It definitely helps that I really like to exercise, but I also really like how exercise improves my insulin sensitivity, thereby making it much easier for me to manage my blood sugars and thereby my A1C to a level that I'm comfortable with. Improved insulin sensitivity basically means that your body becomes more efficient at utilizing the insulin that you either inject or that your body makes. 
And for me, that just means that it becomes easier for me to keep my blood sugars at a steady level. If you do not use insulin to manage your diabetes, exercise might be one of the most effective ways that you can improve your A1C levels. Because when you exercise, again, you improve your insulin sensitivity, thereby making it easier for your body to regulate your blood sugars and thereby pulling down your A1C into a healthier level. So even something as straightforward as a walk can be extremely effective in lowering blood sugars. Because when you walk, you're utilizing some of those larger muscles like your quads and your hamstrings. And when they work, they actually pull glucose out of your bloodstream without any additional insulin present. So that's nifty. I sometimes use something like a walk or a bike ride as a way of lowering my blood sugars, especially after meals. So since I do inject insulin with my food and walking will never, you know, eliminate the need for my insulin, but since I do inject insulin, I do have to be a little careful because if I inject too much insulin and then go for a walk, I'm also at a risk of a low blood sugar. So I do have to dial back my rapid acting insulin a little bit and it is a balancing act, but it's definitely doable. And today's fourth and final thing I do to keep my A1C below 6.5% is understanding how different things impact blood sugars. So I can be more proactive than reactive when it comes to blood sugar management. Upwards of 22 things can impact blood sugars. So I think when we say that diabetes is a full-time job and it's highly complicated, we're not exaggerating. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I know how all 22 things impact my blood sugars or that you should either. But I think it's really important that we pay attention and we learn and get to know those things that impact our blood sugars the most. We all know that carbohydrates impact blood sugars, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But do you also pay attention to some of the other things that can impact blood sugars? How about sleep quality, your stress level, your hydration? How about hormone fluctuations? How are you feeling? Are you sick? Are you drinking a lot of coffee? Yep, I said coffee. Some people actually see quite a significant impact on blood sugars when they drink coffee. My point here is to pay attention to blood sugar patterns and thereby we can identify what impacts our blood sugars and not just when it comes to food, but when it comes to life so that we can manage our blood sugars accordingly. I, for example, often see a blood sugar rise in the morning that has nothing to do with food. It's my body releasing glucose into the bloodstream. So it's a hormonal response. And because I've noticed that, because I've seen it consistently, that means I can proactively go in, give myself a little bit more insulin, and I can prevent high blood sugars in the morning. Another example, I know that if I don't exercise for a week, let's say I'm going on vacation, my insulin sensitivity will drop and my insulin needs will therefore go up. So what that means is I can proactively increase my insulin levels so I won't run high for a whole week. And then there's understanding how different types of food impacts blood sugars. And I'm not just talking about carbs here. Most people, myself included, will see blood sugar impact if you, for example, eat large amount of protein. Nothing wrong with that. It's just something to be aware of so that we can manage for it. But yes, carbohydrates or carbs. Um, it is the micronutrients that we talk the most about because it is the one that will hit blood sugars most aggressively. But the thing is, we don't all react or see the same blood sugar reaction to certain carbs. So for example, uh, let's take something like oatmeal. So some people see very sharp increases in blood sugars, maybe even prolonged increases when they eat oatmeal. I'm likely to be one of those who can eat it without any crazy blood sugar fluctuations. But if you do see those sharp increases or prolonged increases, you might want to consider maybe trying a different portion size, maybe change if you manage with insulin, change up your dosing strategy a little bit, or maybe it's just not worth it for you. And that means cutting it out for a while. That's okay. As long as you pay attention to how it impacts you and come up with a strategy. While I don't believe in letting your diabetes management dictate how you live your life, I do think that we have to assess how different things impact us so that we can come up with strategies for how to best live with those choices or change those choices so that we can live healthy with diabetes and maintain good blood sugar levels and healthy A1Cs. And those were the four things that I do consistently to keep my A1C 
below 6.5%. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a like below and leave me a comment. Also, if you'd like to see more content from me, remember to subscribe to my channel and turn on notifications. That is that little bell. That way you'll be informed whenever I post new content. Thank you so much for watching.